and Elaine will do us the honor of presenting uh, Gabriel and his two special guests, Cheryl Mirandel and uh, Annie Katsura Robbins. So, uh, without waiting any longer, Elaine, thank you. Thank you, merci Sylvie. Uh, welcome to everyone. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce and then moderate today's book launch of Professor Gabrielle Levine's Art and Tradition in a Time of Uprisings. Uh, I added the link to show where you can uh, purchase it at a 20% discount and free shipping from New York University. So you're welcome to go to that link and look in the uh, chat section. Uh, we're meeting today in cyberspace, but many of us are speaking from lands that are caretaken of um, by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis, lands that are now home to many Indigenous peoples, including the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. These are therefore lands marked, as Professor Levine writes, by, quote, the dispossessions of colonial modernity but they are marked too by indigenous resurgence as indigenous actors and artists, quote, retell stories, learn languages, and reclaim everyday life practices in the service of creative flourishing in the present. We are fortunate today to have with us two artists who participate, well, Gabrielle, three artists, at least three artists, and Emily Changer, so many more, but uh, three artists who are actively participating um, in this discussion and in this creative flourishing um, in what Professor Levine might describe as an encounter between practitioners and their traditions. Uh, the first is uh, Cheryl uh, Le Hirondel. She is an award-winning and community-engaged interdisciplinary artist, singer-songwriter, and critical thinker, whose family is from Papache's uh, First Nations and Kikino Métis Settlement. Her current projects are many, but they include Why the Caged Bird Sings, a collaborative songwriting project with incarcerated women, men, and detained youth. Our second artist participating today is Anna Katsura Rollins. She's a researcher, theater, and puppetry artist and practitioner of Chinese shadow puppetry, who recently completed a PhD at Concordia University on the precarity of safeguarding traditional puppet forms. She has exhibited, lectured, and performed at venues including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Montreal Botanical Gardens, the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, the Linden Center in Yunnan, China, and the Wright Build Academy in the Netherlands. Both are here as part of the vernacular practice of this gathering, the quote, assembling together of everything and everyone needed for an event. An event that, of course, includes everyone now listening. So we're very glad that you were here to celebrate Gabe's book uh, today with us. What then of uh, Professor Levine's book? Reading, I was gratified to see many personally familiar yet eclectic references uh, from the Chicago Art Ensemble to the 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza to puppetry to punning indigenous stage names like Bear Witness to the poetry of Walt Whitman. There are descriptions of dancing and do-it-yourself theater, meal sharing and beer drinking, and there is a bonfire. Uh, there's, al there's also a mention, which I, I existentially identified with, uh, of a middle-aged unhipster. Anyway, that's a digression. Uh, but more than this eclecticism, what is striking is the irrepressible optimism at the heart of this book. Although Professor Levine describes, quote, the hurt of history, and explicitly names a total climate of white supremacy, genocide, and lived oppression within settler colonial and capitalist society. His book is both a description and a celebration of many different forms of experiment and play that exceed the boundaries of this violent inheritance. As the book's title suggests, experiment and play includes what Levine terms radical vernacular practices of art and tradition the quote, rerouting into the soil of collective practice, honoring its complex and entangled forms of life. This includes first explorations of a tricked up and queered out carnivalesque play on the Jewish Purim festival. Second, the sonic mashup of the Indian musical group, a tribe called Red. And third, the political, but also literal ferments of sourdough starters and kombucha mothers, very appropriate for the moment, where Gabe suggests the quiet bubbling of organic substances reminds us of the slow, often invisible work of organizing together, 
for progressive, transformative social change. At their playful relationship building best, these three different practices are what Spinoza might describe as joyful activity. As Spinoza writes in a famous passage from his magnum opus, The Ethics, it is right to refresh and restore the self and others with pleasant food and drink, with scents, with the beauty of green plants, with decoration and ornament, music, sports, the theater, and other kinds of things which anyone can use without injury to another. Not only, we might add, without injury to another, but as Gabe's book descriptively affirms, convivially with others, hospitably, quote, welcoming the strange stranger. Whatever the difference is between a queer Purim party, an evening DJ by a tribe called Red, or the practice of growing sourdough bread, all, at least potentially, communally welcome the stranger in her strangeness, as Emmanuel Levinas might insist, in her queer, Jewish, indigenous, and finally, creaturely strangeness as a human being in this transient, earthly world. This world is not always convivial and may, on the contrary, be violent. Traditions reinvented may celebrate white supremacy. Sharing can disappear into fractious, egoistic rivalries. Moreover, there is an evanescent quality to all of these practices, or as Gabe describes it more prosaically, after the ecstasy, the laundry. But equally, and this is Professor Levine's emphasis throughout, the reinvention of art and traditions can lead to new meaning making in ways that celebrate necessary human connection. As Gabe explains, the types of projects that I discuss, this is a quote, festivals, dance parties, and shared meals are thoroughly participatory in their form. They are not social practice or participatory art, but rather experiential performances that require participation if they are to exist at all. If we understand performance in this participatory experiential sense, we might ask ourselves what sharing means in this particular historical moment of the pandemic. Festivals, dance parties, and shared meals are forms of conviviality that are no longer possible. Worse, we are not, quote, all in this together. We know that the pandemic and associated quarantine measures continue and deepen existing uh, inequities related to colonialism and indigeneity, race and class, gender and citizenship. But Levine refuses to see rubble and even devastation as the end. Rather, with a tenacious optimism rooted in praxis, he insists that even in the ruins, there are new grounds for imaginative, generous play, not only with those who are like ourselves, but others in all their creaturely sameness, and particular differences. As the Jewish American writer Robert Pinsky observes in his poem, aptly named Ceremony, and as uh, Gabe himself right remind us, at the end of the story, when the plague has arrived, the performance can begin. So thank you very much. It's my honor now to introduce uh, Gabe Levine. And uh, uh, but before that, uh, Cheryl Irondel is going to have uh, a response. Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Elaine. That's what a wonderful introduction to the book. And I want you to send me a copy of that so I can read it again. <laughs> and maybe we can post it as well, because it's really very eloquent. And I think you really got to the heart of the book. Um, I am going to say just a couple of words, and then I'll read a little bit with accompaniment from my uh, collaborator, Shadow Puppeteer, Annie Katsura Rollins, and then Cheryl's gonna uh, have a response after that. So I don't want to add too much to what uh, Elaine had to say, and I'll, I'll maybe shorten a little bit of what I, what I was gonna say about the book. I'll just hold it up to do a little show and tell. It's been a long journey. The seeds of this book first started germinating about 10 years ago in the aftermath of the 2008 uh, financial crisis, in particular once a lot of uh, very inspiring movements started to emerge out of that uh, moment of difficulty and danger. Movements protesting economic inequality, uh, the colonial state, ecological devastation, and looking at these movements, you know, in particular ones close to me, the student movements, uh, 
Idle No More Occupy as well with all of its complications. I felt this kind of strange sense of, you know, deja vu maybe in a positive way that there was sort of like a, a, this continual resurgence of these kinds of practices that had these very deep roots in basic human sociality going way back. Like what I, what I started to understand as uh, intergenerational collective practice or vernacular practices, which is really what I'm getting at in the book. And it really reminded me both of political movements I'd been involved in as you know, a young artist and activist in the late 90s, early 2000s, also of my own music and theater work that I'd been involved in uh, in Montreal. And so I decided I really wanted to try to articulate what it was about all this stuff that, that really drew me. And it was something about this engagement with collective practices that had been abandoned or suppressed for different reasons and the different reasons really became kind of the crux of the book that what I saw what I started to call experiments with tradition uh, ended up playing out quite differently in these neoliberal settler colonies that many of us live in depending on who was doing the experimenting and under which circumstances so the book is I, I really love that quote from Spinoza uh, Elaine there's so much of an anchor in joyful collective practice, but then understanding how those practices really are channeled, shaped, conditioned uh, by the circumstances in which they find themselves, in which we all find ourselves. And that includes, you know, our current circumstance of, of uh, how to create, how to work uh, together under these conditions of social isolation, physical distancing. If, while staying connected in these other ways, right? And I think what you're seeing now, and maybe we can talk about this in the Q&A, is kind of new vernaculars being experimented with currently through the means that are available. And that is my definition of vernacular practice. It's actually from Julian Henriquez in his book Sonic Bodies about Jamaican dance hall, where he talks about assembling anything and everything needed for an event. So that's, you know, shout out to Julian Henriquez there. Um, so yes, the book does have these three kind of case studies of the Apsalachis Spectacle Committee, Jews for Racial Economic Justice, their Purim party in New York, this amazing, wacky, queer political spectacle, the work of A Tribe Called Red and other indigenous musicians and media artists, uh, rerouting tradition in stunningly experimental ways. And then this kind of messy, complex social phenomenon of the ongoing revival of home fermentation techniques, which I just find endlessly fascinating and which for me goes way back to my encounter with uh, Bread and Puppet Theater, Peter Schumann, great baker of sourdough bread, uh, the director of Bread and Puppet, the word uprisings is definitely from his kind of lineage and practice. But then also that's where I met Sander Alex Katz, uh, author of Wild Fermentation and Art of Fermentation. So, you know, it's amazing, I think, to me how these kind of chance encounters or experiences that seem arbitrary end up fermenting over many decades and then, you know, emerging in these kind of new forms, in this case of the book. So I'll just, uh, I'll just read a little bit from the introduction. And uh, Annie Katsura Rollins, who's a wonderful uh, puppeteer and shadow artist, is going to jam on some shadows while I do that, just as a way of using Zoom in, in I think, hopefully a creative way. And um, I'll read just from the beginning of the book, because it sort of lays out a little bit of what's going on and what's at stake, I think, in, in this book. But also because uh, I'm so excited that the artist, singer-songwriter, Cheryl Lirondell is here. And I actually begin the book with a description of a project that she and the wonderful Camille Turner, who's also here, hi Camille, uh, they collaborated on this project, Freedom Tours, which was actually a two-part project. I focus on the part uh, in Rouge Park. Here's a wonderful photo of this parade by uh, the photos by Jelani Morgan. Thank you for letting me print this. Um, so, it's an honor in a way of Cheryl's presence that I can, uh, that I can um, read this passage. So, oh, I see my camera got confused. All right, so let's, uh, let's begin and uh, Priska, you can uh, pin Annie's video. All right, so this is Practices of Freedom from the introduction. On a blazing summer day in the city of Toronto, from the Ghanaian Gahaga word to Toronto, 
where there are trees in the water. A motley procession of children and adults winds its way down a paved road through a sun-bleached river valley. Rouge Park, a new urban national park that follows the Rouge River through forests and marshlands down to Lake Ontario, has been closed to car traffic for the day, setting the scene for Freedom Tours, a project by artists Cheryl Lirondel and Camille Turner. Kids from the inner suburbs wave flags hand printed with local flora and fauna in primary colors, each marked with a number sign as if tweeting the creaturely world. Hashtag turtle, hashtag eagle, hashtag bumblebee, hashtag strawberry. The flags are by Susie Belcourt. Groups of young marchers grasp multicolored handmade banners, river of life freedom flags, honoring the land and its sustenance. The summer of 2017 marked the 150th birthday of the Canadian state, which is why Lirondel and Turner, in an irreverent gesture, have sewn upside down Canadian flags onto their white aprons. I joined the procession with my excited two-year-old, who runs ahead of me brandishing his little strawberry flag down the narrow road. Participants take turns at a megaphone, improvising songs dedicated to Mother Earth. We stop periodically and the kids are invited to speak to the land, to tell Mother Earth their hopes and fears for the future. Eyes meet, smiles and words are exchanged. The sun beats down on our little parade. We're not making epochal change here. No grand policy is being shifted and the only spectators watching are the birds, frogs and squirrels, along with other critters who escape our notice. But I feel an infectious lightness and joy as we walk through this valley in the middle of the city's sprawl, taking up space and singing to the trees and grasses. A national park, a cordoned off colonial space, is being reclaimed by collective vernacular practice. The freedom tour that these artists have concocted is a temporary event, not a permanent transformation. But it could be described as a practice of freedom, a collective bodily engagement in an alternative way of being in the world. Led by indigenous and African diasporic artists, this particular practice of freedom includes native and non-native people, newcomers and descendants of migrants and settlers, all called upon to become caretakers of the land. Aided by simple and repeatable technologies, megaphones, prints, songs, banners, the shared practice of walking puts us in a different embodied relationship to each other and the land we move through. When my tired kid climbs into the stroller for a nap, I turn around and retrace our steps, past hydro lines, train tracks, and pipelines carrying diluted bitumen from the Alberta tar sands, running through the valley's dried out marshes. As we re-enter the city with its traffic and noise, my body is filled with the reverberations of this walk echoes that are still with me as I write and now read these lines. In this book, I've sought out other moments of collective reclaiming, what I call radical vernaculars, and tried to convey their rooted yet experimental engagement with supposedly outmoded cultural practices. Vernaculars, in a sense I developed from the common use of the word to describe everyday speech, are collective ways of doing, making, and thinking that are not sanctioned by official cultural institutions. They tend to be improvisational, rough, and opportunistic, gathering the materials and techniques at hand and combining them in new relations. The experiments with vernacular practice that I examine can be highly skilled or deliberately clunky. They can engage with sophisticated media technologies or with the simplest of discarded materials. My argument in this book is that experimenting with vernacular practices, especially ones that are considered to be elements of traditional culture, can offer powerful resources for reshaping shared ways of being in the world. These practices move through a world that is profoundly damaged, both ecologically and socially. In a time when lived experience is increasingly mediated through corporate platforms, when natural cultural ecologies worldwide are under attack by extractive industries, and when masses of souls are at work creating value for the billionaire class, these small scale modes of collective practice can seem puny and insignificant. Yet their power, while limited, is real. 
as I argue in the book, collective projects that experiment with what have been called traditional practices can help dislodge their participants from colonial and capitalist regimes of time and property. Their experimental practices of freedom can produce new modes of shared subjectivity, aesthetic and political forms, and horizons of collective action. This potency depends, however, on their ability to confront the herd of history, to engage with and transform the ongoing legacies of settler capitalism that make tradition mean markedly different things across colonial and racial lines. This book about radical vernaculars, collective practice and experimental aesthetics is the result of an individual trajectory. My understanding of what it means to reclaim discarded or suppressed traditions has been shaped by what, by what might be called an apprenticeship in the old arts, alongside a growing awareness of my participation in settler regimes of time and property. Growing up in an intellectual Ashkenazi Jewish family in Toronto, in self-imposed exile from New York, they always said, I participated without much self-reflection in the settler modes of belonging encouraged by the Canadian state and educational institutions. Later as a young musician and theater student living in Montreal, I gravitated toward alternative modes of collective art making, founding and participating in a number of independent bands and theater collectives. One pole of my existence at that time was the burgeoning experimental scene gathered around Montreal's Constellation Records with its shadowy aesthetic anti-capitalist principles and commitment to sustaining an experimental community of musical practitioners. The other pole which opened up a new world of collective art and practice for me was Vermont's Bread and Puppet Theater, which I joined as an apprentice and then a company member in the late 1990s for the last two years of the epic outdoor event, Our Domestic Resurrection Circus. During my time working with this theater company, I experienced how collective art making could open up a different way of being in the world. One based on shared food production, cooking and eating and dishwashing and singing and music making, as much as on theatrical or artistic creation. Bread and Puppet's philosophy of cheap art, which seeks to reclaim art making for everyday practice rather than leave it to a rarefied sphere of galleries and museums, has stayed with me since I left the company. I carried this spirit into the collectives that I founded with collaborators in Montreal, the experimental Yiddish musical group Black Arcs Orchestra and the puppet theater company Le Petit Théâtre de l'Absolu, along with other more recent groups and projects. Although many of these collectives splintered under the pressure of competing personalities and the exigencies of making a living, I've held on to the subversive energy that they found in reclaiming so-called traditional or vernacular practices. If one anchor of this book is my shared artistic history of experiments with tradition, another is a growing sense of how these experiments have been shaped by regimes of time and property in the North American settler colony. The projects that I have founded or participated in, whether experimenting with the cast off vernaculars of my Jewish heritage, reclaiming histories of collective political struggle or exploring more personal roots and branches, have all occurred within a specifically settler colonial, temporal, cultural, and legal political framework. As I explore in the next chapter, well, through the book, in fact, this is a framework in which time is progressive and future oriented, and in which the property owning, self possessed individual is the basic unit of sociocultural life. I've worked with the help of others to resist these settler capitalist regimes of time and property, which have caused such ecological and human damage. My shared projects have worked to reclaim suppressed or abandoned pasts while opening toward collective modes of practice that undo the self-possession of the acquisitive individual. But given my position as a white settler subject, these struggles have been elective, not essential. Settler capitalist regimes of time and property have quite different effects on indigenous and racialized subjects who are positioned in specific ways as the others of white settler modernity. Reclaiming means different things in different social locations for different times and different peoples and with different stakes. My own efforts at reclaiming have been driven by an aesthetic and political commitment to a more just and equitable world rather than by a necessity for collective cultural, political and bodily continuance in a total climate of white supremacy, genocide and lived oppression. 
skip a little bit now. In some respects, global historical events have overtaken the often fragile and small scale experiments that I put forward here. Politically and ecologically, the earth lurches from crisis to crisis, as in the current one we're in now, with the current turn to immediatized authoritarian populism, postponing any reckoning with accelerating damage to the land and its inhabitants. Looking over the past three decades of political experimentation, some intellectuals on the left condemn any recourse to the small scale and the intimate as folk politics, arguing that such strategies are in no way commensurate to the scale of the challenges faced by our species and our planet. They're partly right. What I'm proposing in this book is not a structural solution to the ravages of global capitalism and the trauma of ongoing colonial legacies. Instead of folk politics, which suggests, suggests a constrained political horizon, I analyze specific experiments at the level of vernacular embodied practice. These are shared techniques that encourage their practitioners as the philosopher Isabel Stengers argues to quote, think, imagine, and resist. These practices of freedom might be as simple as joining a parade for Mother Earth through a grassy valley in the middle of the city, surrounded by buzzing insects and electrical lines, waving animal printed flags and singing songs into a megaphone. Or they might involve more elaborate forms of gathering, more sophisticated technologies, and more complex arrangements of humans and non-humans. Across colonial lines and a world deeply damaged by capitalism's profit-seeking drive, how can souls find the courage to think, imagine, and resist when they have been captured in countless ways? This book offers a number of possible answers to this question. Thank you, Annie, for the shadows. And I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Yeah, thanks, Annie. I'll turn it over to Cheryl now. One is God, they ma panoma, sa se pisi sak niga muak, they me you and I guan get the skin. So I'll translate that um, what I just sang for you, Gabriel. Um, one ska, wake up, dewa panoma, to come and witness the light that is rising. Already the birds are singing. Come and witness how beautiful our land is looking. And I think um, I sing that for you because I think the, the book uh, um, and what you've read as your uh, excerpt really do speak to that notion that as long as we continue to witness and be part of the earth turning and the sun rising. That's how we all become part of a, a, a larger continuum and, and, uh, and keep things life affirming, which your book is also about. It's a very life affirming book. Thank you.
And now we're going to proceed to just a moment of exchange uh, between uh, Cheryl and Gabe, if there are any further thoughts that uh, you'd like to share with the rest of us in a, in a small conversation. Mm. I just want to start off by saying thank you uh, so much, Cheryl, for sharing the song and for being part of this gathering. Uh, and I'm, I have lots of questions for you as an artist who I think is really, your work is so important at this moment because you're somebody who's linking, you know, a really strong commitment to the land and to your own uh, search and pathways through indigenous practice with media technologies as things that can enable and strengthen those pathways. So I wonder if you have any thoughts, you know, this is, now this is sort of a huge question, but like given the current moment, you know, how do we keep and foster those links? You know, how can we practice with the land right now, let's say? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think, um, you know, that song that I just sang was shared with me by a, an old man who's passed on now. And, um, uh, you know, the day after he passed on, I woke up in the morning really early, like I couldn't sleep. I think I was in some ways upset and uh, mourning. And, I woke up in the morning and the sun was just starting to come up and I was talking to him because I knew he was still quite close. And, um, and I said, well, what are we going to do? Because his whole life was about these ceremonies, making these ceremonies that really, when you think of what a lot of, um, a lot of ceremonialists are doing is they're helping the earth to keep turning. You know, that's, mm -hmm. what their, that's what their work is. Their whole life is dedicated to that. They're not part of neoliberalism. Uh, and in fact, I won't say his name because he didn't ever want me to be part of this world of art making. It's like, that's not who he is. At any rate, um, it was like his voice came to me in that moment and he said, well, you know that song. So you know what you, what, how you can help, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that um, that's what you're, so much in your book that you're sort of covering and I, I really love the focus on tradition because it used to be a bone of contention for me as an artist. I had moved uh, up to a reserve community, nine reserve communities actually in the um, uh, uh, early, late, 80, uh, late 80s, no, early, early 90s and I was working with um, Knowledge Keeper Joseph Natau, who was also a storyteller and songwriter. And um, I remember back in the city, there was people who used to say, oh, well, she's not making art anymore. She's moved, she's living mm -hmm. on reserve. So there was really interest, and that was from the indigenous community. So that was really interesting that at that time in the 90s, there was that split, that notion of, you know, if you're traditional, you know, you're not part of this other world. And I was doing, at the time I was doing these brilliant little performances that were, um, because I was learning Cree uh, and still am, I was, um, doing these little mini orgasms, you know, kind of from when Harry, when Harry, when, what is it, when Harry met Sally, mm -hmm. you know, that famous yep. orgasm at the table. Mm -hmm. So I was doing those in Cree because I was learning Cree. And for me, it was performance art. I was doing performance art mm -hmm. at all these old ladies' tables and they would laugh their heads off because, you know, they were fluent speakers and they appreciated my attempt at learning. And I remember there was a curator who's now long passed on. Um, and at the time when I was telling him about it, you know, years later, he said, well, how can it be performance art? It wasn't part of a gallery, you know, no curator curated it, you know. So I think we're in a really interesting time where so much of what you've covered in your book Actually, it's, it's a good, it's, your book is like a handbook now on how to proceed into the future. It really is. And in fact, you know, we could put a post-it note and say, uh, uh, art in a time of, <laughs> of pandemic, you know, or, absolutely, absolutely. Or, or upheaval, complete upheaval. Mm -hmm. Because um, anyways, I, I, I um, come from a family that makes a short story really long. So I'll let you speak. No, no, no. You should. <laughs> it's your event. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you're a guest of, you're a guest of honor. <laughs> but I think just to, just to answer the thing about technology, and I think you've covered it well in the book and, and that famous um, essay that, uh, well, famous, uh, say that in quotation marks, um, you know, Candace Hopkins saying, yeah, making essay. things our own, you know, mm -hmm. really is this notion. And, and, and it reminded me, there's so many passages in the book that reminded me of a story that uh, Chief Lynn Akus, who is the chief of Sagame Reserve, and, she, and she's also a critical thinker, and she uh, may also be a poet, but I've known her for many years. And she told me a story many years ago about how 
um, there was a old, um, an old man and an old woman and they were doing a ceremony and um, he was, there was native and non-native people there. And, uh, and at one point, uh, this one young woman who was non-indigenous spoke up and said, because he said, he acclaimed, he said, this is a ceremony that my ancestors have been doing since time immemorial. And uh, she said to him, well, how can that be? Because you're wearing jeans and you've got a mm. big belt buckle on, you've got mm. cowboy boots on, and your smudge pan is, is a cast iron pan. Like, how, how can that be? And um, he said, um, he said, it's, I'm doing what my ancestors have always done. We've always adapted. That's right. You know? And we've always made use of whatever technology or tools are around us to, as part of this continuum. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, and I think that's kind of where, where I get to in thinking about tradition in the book. You, drawing on the wonderful phrase by Amiri Baraka, the changing same, that, that, you know, yes, doing what you've always done is adapting. And yet, there's something that endures as well. Like there's something that's carried over, that's passed on through generations, even if it's more of a style of practice uh, or a set of values or commitments than, you know, uh, a specific kind of thing, right? So really thinking of tradition as a, as a, almost like a verb rather than a noun. And the book in general moves, tries to move, you know, culture and practice from, from noun to verb uh, all throughout. Yeah, that's true. You also, um, I mean, you cover it really well, but my issue at the beginning when people were saying, oh, she's gone traditional and, you know, and yeah. um, uh, because, because it was sort of a, a hodgepodge of, are you talking about, is it cultural? Are you saying it's historic? Are you saying it's rural or reserve based? Are you saying mm. it's ceremonial? Are you saying it's language centered? Like it was like everything got dumped into that and it became kind of like, um, like the word petri dish, we petri dish has become very negative, and yet that's nothing wrong with a petri dish, you know. Right. Or 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 a culture, you know, like a like the metaphor of fermentation is uh, is apt, you know. Culture is a bit like some kind of strange bacterial colony or something <laughs> yeah. that the way and grows and more, you know, changes. Yeah, and I was also thinking um, in Cree um, when there was there was whole you know, a lot of re, you know, redoing this, mm -hmm, reclaiming mm -hmm. that, you know, um, in Cree, the word, the term, asemina, it means again. Mm. But if you really break it apart and look at it, it actually is kind of like still and, or already and. So it really is this notion of there's no sense of uh, it, it ended and we're starting it again. It's, it's just morphed and cha changed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think we can say that about everybody's work who sort of engaged in you know sort of going deep within yourself but not as an individualistic act going deep mm. within yourself to find that root as you as you mm. so eloquently write about mm. i i want to i want to uh, get to questions and others thoughts but there's there's something that really struck me you know when you agreed to come and sing a song, I, th I thought how much singing there is in the book, actually. And it's a, it's, a book of, it's a book filled with singing, strangely, even though it's not a book nominally about singing. And then you, you know, shared a beautiful song with us. And there's, I know there's a lot of singers here. You know, I'm a singer and there's, I, there's a whole lot of community of singers. Like somehow we both know Fides uh, Kruker, who's here. And lots of folks on the call do as well. And I'm just wondering, you know, it's really struck me how singing right now, ha shared singing is one of the main vectors of transmission of this virus, right? Like we cannot sing together at the moment. And it's such an incredible loss. How do we navigate that moment? You know, and maybe, it's, maybe it is about like realizing how things like shared singing are not a kind of, add on, they're not an optional add on to being human. You know, they're kind of constitutive of, of our sociality. And maybe this is what reminds us of that. I don't know. But, uh, you know, what is singing in, the, in this time of the, of the pandemic? It's a really good question. Um, you know, the, uh, I think I heard, first heard this from the late Hank Bull, and he was talking about how to conspire really means to breathe together, you know. And so we are in this challenging place. But I think you know, masked, we can still be proximate and still breathing mm. together. So we can mm. still be doing things together. Um, I think 
uh, some of the things that have come out of this pandemic have been really lovely. If you think of it, people on their balconies just singing out, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I really appreciate it. You really focused in the introduction specifically about that sort of power of when you go to those events that you know that it's something that's a transformative thing that's happening. But, you know, my sort of uh, thing that I'm always writing is, yes, but it is heavily commodified. Everything, mm -hmm. everything, you know, gets to be heavily commodified. Mm -hmm. And we're in this position now where, you know, concerts halls will close and yeah. museums will close. And we have to now take to the streets, take to our balconies, take to other methods to, to continue singing. And, um, and part of that singing and that part of that vernacular, that radical vernacular is engaging with land specifically, you know, mm -hmm. and engaging with the participants of a place in, in radically different ways. And mm -hmm. I think, again, your book is a perfect handbook for all of this. So. All right. Handbook, book for our times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, do we want to proceed now to just the moment of reflection? Yeah, or? sure. Yeah. Um, so the so the idea was that people could just take a moment, maybe about four or five minutes. To, Wait, let's say let's say even three minutes, right? Let's three, three minutes yeah. just to re to reflect on a question. You can write it in the chat and just hold that question for three minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say you can write the question in the chat, but just wait to send it yeah. until the end of the three minutes, so that we can all kind of receive your your responses at the same time. Yeah. Thanks, Elaine. Okay. Great. You can you can you can finish that thought if you. Want. <laughs> okay. No, it's cooperative. It's good. It's cooperative yeah. uh, over the internet in action. So yeah. So you're welcome to write in. And in, in, while we're doing that, there's going to be another short video that's being uh, played by Any Katsura. So. Uh, we'll have some artistic inspiration while we consider the questions we might like to throw out there and ask. So go to it. Okay, so if people feel ready, thank you so much, uh, Annie, for that uh, beautiful visual poem, since I'm a person who thinks often in words, thank you for the visual poem. And if you'd like to um, uh, send out your questions by chat, and while everyone is doing that, I'd like to invite 
Jennifer Biddle, who is joining us all the way from Australia um, to uh, contribute a question. I know it's very early in the morning there and Jennifer got up uh, very early. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can unmute Jennifer. Okay, th I might have to ask Priska to do that. Because I can't actually no. find it. I believe Jennifer is already unmuted. Okay, Jennifer, if, yeah. you're, if, <laughs> if you'd like to ask your question, please go ahead. Or respond. Or Hi, Jennifer. Great to see you if you're around. <laughs> it's a long way to Australia. And if you want to see other people. I've got I've got ten year old help here. Yeah, <laughs> Jennifer has a really old cat. She may be feeding her old cat right now. So <laughs> I, I I will ask a question which continues on the old themes while people are still thinking, and that is how do we you know if joy is one of the themes of this book and joy happens through participation, um, and 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 uh, kind of making do and creating with others. What do we do in this moment? What are the possibilities? I mean, I think I think we're trying to figure that out right now. You know, it's a it's a it's a hard moment, and the, it, it's hard because it's as you know, as you said, Elaine, in your introduction, suffering and difficulty are extremely unequally distributed right now. So some of us, you know, are dealing with frustrations in a very kind of mundane way, like the frustration of kind of like what I'm, I mean, I, maybe I'll just speak personally, but like what I find so striking at the moment is how our current isolation is giving the lie to I, the idea of the nuclear family as a kind of self-sufficient, independent, cultural, you know, social unit. Like it might be an ideology in our culture, but it's not at all how we live. Like, in fact, raising a child is a, is a, thoroughly collective social practice and dependent on a very thick kind of social uh, network of support. So that's, that's, uh, that's my experience. I mean, I knew this already, of course, but it's, you know, my partner and I are isolating with our five-year-old and I'm sure many of you are isolating with children as well. And, you know, we really realized like we must do this together, right? And we have to figure out if we are forced to do this, uh, you know, to observe these very sensible health guidelines, how can we find new vernaculars of collective engagement as, you know, in ways of educating and raising our children, right? So, and I, I do think that's kind of what I'm asking in the book too, is like, we have to reinvent our lives together collectively. And this is one case where we have to do this. And that's, that's again, a sort of, you know, speaking from a position of non-emergency, right? Like uh, others are forced to invent, invent and reinvent those practices in the middle of, you know, exposure to uh, all kinds of dangers and, and precarity. So with all of those degrees, I think we're faced with, with those questions, let's say. Uh, there's a there's a question also from Andrew Sofer, and he says, what wonderful, uh, thank you. I'm curious whether the argument is one, all vernacular practices are potentially radical or two, that some vernaculars are radical and others aren't. And he said, if the latter, so only small questions being asked, what makes for the radical? Does there need mm. to be radical effect or just radical intention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, where I kind of get into that question is in my, uh, I, I, have a, I have a discussion of uh, property in the book, you know, and around forms of property and time, like really in a way, like the two kind of key structures in the book are time and property. And if you think about time in the settler colony, it's a kind of forward progressive, uh, future oriented version of how time works. Uh, you know, we're all trying to improve ourselves. And this is where the kind of neoliberal idea of practice comes in. We're all trying to work on ourselves, improve ourselves, you know, burnish our CVs, sculpt our bodies, learn how to bake bread even, right? Like it's this kind of like strange sort of desire for future oriented improvement. So the, so a kind of radical engagement with time might mean, you know, just 
not not being willing to participate in that kind of progressive future oriented march of time in the settler colony saying like we're going to go back as well as forward we're not going to be and i think that's is especially crucial for indigenous people in settler colonies you know where the choice the false choice is either to you know perform some kind of uh authentic version of tradition right like cheryl was saying without jeans or cast iron pans <laughs> or to assimilate to the forward march of progressive settler modernity and it's a false choice right so i think there's a radicality there in rejecting those choices. Um, and in terms of property, it's really around the idea of the possessive individual or like the nuclear family, let's say, as the, as the basic unit of sociocultural life. That I think, um, you know, looking at vernacular practices worldwide of sustaining common life and sustaining the land uh, there's other ways of uh, in, of practicing property that are not acquisitive, that are not about individual ownership, right? Which leads to all kinds of uh, all kinds of horrible phenomena, including chattel slavery and you know the dispossession of indigenous peoples and so on. So I don't know if that answers the question, but I but to me those are the kind of uh, ways that collective intergenerational practices, including digging up or reviving abandoned or suppressed paths can actually be have a kind of radical quality. There's another question from Asha Jeffers who asks, were there practices that you considered including uh, but did not that you would like to highlight here? Ah, that's very interesting. Hi Asha, long time. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, like I, I mean, I, as I went, as I kind of mulled over the book, I mean, there was, let's say the most obvious example, which is that uh, there was a chapter that was removed from the book. <laughs> so in that sense, there's quite literally been an excision, um, which was this very interesting uh, workshop that I participated in. Uh, Justice Harris is here from that workshop, the Abandoned Practices Institute, which is run by uh, the brilliant former members of the Goat Island Performance Collective, Matthew Gulish, Lynn Hickson, Mark Jeffrey, and others, uh, they've been running this through the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. My friend Amber Yared turned me on to this. And I ended up going and doing this workshop in Prague where it's a kind of art education, performance pedagogy workshop about abandoned practices, you know, like really about the kind of material that I was working on for the book. I found it totally fascinating, I had a wonderful time. Ultimately, it wasn't the same kind of, uh, it was a kind of, it was within the frame of aesthetics or art, you know, like it didn't really step out of that frame, even though the collective life that we led during that workshop was extremely fertile and creative, you know, but it didn't quite fit with the rest of the book. So it had to, it had to go. But otherwise my, pre my process in coming up with the book, I just really gravitated towards stuff that you know, really got under my skin in positive ways, mostly like stuff that I felt really drawn to, wanted to puzzle out practices and, and projects that I felt were really rich and multifaceted and that led in all sorts of other directions. So th th that was it. And it, there was no, you know, the book is a bit of an eclectic, obviously it's very eclectic collection, uh, but it's very personal in that way. It's just, you know, what, who did I want to think with? You know, who, which these amazing artists, Jenny Romaine and, and uh, the other members of the Axelakis Spectacle Committee, members of A Tribe Called Red and other indigenous music and media artists, uh, Sandra Alex Katz, what a wonderful human being. Uh, you know, so just really interesting people who I wanted to think with through this process. Jennifer, do we want to try again? How oh, we can see but can't hear. Uh, can you unmute her? I can't actually see her. Yeah, she's not, she's not muted, so. Uh, sorry, Jennifer, we failed our, <laughs> our transcontinental Zoom test. But, yeah. mm. If you type it, I can read it, which is not quite as convivial, but um, there, there was another question in the meantime about uh, looking after our elders, and of course people are separated, but there's also in, in you know, the, the opening of the book starts with this intergenerational moment, because you're out walking with your son. So I don't know if you had any reflections on that, that is, you know, both looking to our elders and involving young people in these, these kinds of creative vernacular practices. 
Yeah, and I'd love Cheryl to speak to that too, actually. But let me just say first, um, you know, Annie, thank you again, Annie, for the wonderful images, but there's this image, yay, shadow hand. There's this image of the puzzle pieces, uh, you know, being separating. And, and this actually kind of comes from this wonderful story by Maria Campbell, the Cree Métis author, who it's actually in a preface to another book, uh, Kim Anderson's Life Stages and Native Women, where she writes about the story of um, uh, a teacher of hers who uh, took a jigsaw puzzle that she and her family had just made and dropped the puzzle and shattered it into a million pieces. And, she, and he said, this is what happened to our traditions, the, the, you know, her, her ancestral indigenous traditions. They've been totally scattered and disrupted, you know, and, uh, and what's necessary is this kind of long patient work of kind of trying to put a puzzle together again. And I say in the book, which I, I mean, I thought a lot about this image. I said, you know, what do you lose when you break the puzzle? And the puzzle is a funny, it doesn't totally work, but what do you break? You don't break the picture, right? I mean, who cares about the picture? It's already on the box when you start doing the puzzle. It's not like you want to make this picture. What you lose is this labor of assembly. And in this case, it's the labor that she engaged with, with her children, right, of making this puzzle together. And so that's really what I thought, what I got to around thinking about tradition and, you know, in, as intergenerational collective vernacular practice, that it's, it's, it's about the labor across generations. And that's key for the book too, you know, especially in the, in the um, Purimspiel chapter as well, thinking about uh, generations and language transmission and like the, the language of Yiddish in that case and how uh, genocide and assimilation and suppression have broken those intergenerational lineages and how can they be reimagined, you know, not as they always were or as they really are, but in a kind of creative state of becoming, as Jennifer says in her, in her blurb on the back cover. So yeah, the inter intergenerational element is really key, you know, and how, and I think it's especially key in indigenous practice as well. I don't know, Cheryl, I don't know if you want to say anything about elders and generations or anything like that. Um, I, I could, but I think Jennifer might be here. Jennifer? All right, she's not. Um, yeah, I think, um, oh, let's see. The labor of assembly, I think that's um, a lovely notion. And, and if you think of, um, what I've learned from uh, Leroy Little Bear, and he talks about the Blackfoot and the, the Kainai and the Siksika, where he who he is, that um, every year, if you think of it, they would they would move to a new camp, and it was always the old women who would know when it was time. And so, you know, there wasn't this sort of prescribed notion of like it is the fifteenth of March, and we now have to do this, or or we're going to do it exactly this way. I mean, there was always this preoccupation and really, really close um, uh, monitoring, and monitoring might not be a good word, but just sort of being, and being one with nature sounds a little uh, new agey, but uh, so many of our, our laws um, are based on natural law, you know, based on the natural sort of rhythms. So I think that, um, you know, I think that's what old people now are sort of telling the new, next generations. There'll be there will be those puzzle pieces and those fragments that you're going to have to pull together um, to make meaning of things. But if, as long as you stay rooted and connected to the land, you know, and speaking the language of the land, you mm -hmm. know, um, there's a lot of work being done, especially in Cree communities right now. And when you, when you were writing about the, the story about Maria and Ochis, um, it reminded me of actually what's really exciting right now is there's a lot of um, um, etymology work, Mm. linguistic etymology work that's very much and I, i'm writing about it in my in my phd the notion of this sort of embodied you know cognitive linguistics this notion of mm. we walk it we move it we are it you know and it's quite profound so it's almost thank you for the puzzle pieces you know because that's the work thanks to maria campbell for that yeah too. <laughs> yeah and that's the work that's the work mm. of our life is is putting together those pieces in meaningful ways to mm -hmm. make meaning you know, and where, maybe where the, where the analogy falters is that in the end, it's not a puzzle that you make and it's done. Like it's an ever ongoing process, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Uh, we'll try one more time with Jennifer. If not, you should really go discover her own work, which is very interesting. She's done work uh, precisely on many of these questions around uh, the reinvention of tradition by Aboriginal artists in Australia in a very beautifully illustrated book. So if we can't have her now, we'll have to invite her back to the CLRCC or something to uh, talk about her own work on another occasion. I don't know if you're able to communicate, Jessica or sorry, Jennifer. Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer or can you guys, I just tried to like There in. we go, Yay! it works. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so it's incredibly lovely to see you all. You can definitely hear and see me, yeah? Yep. Okay, participatory modes of broadband, wow. Um, good morning to you all and greetings and thank you so much. It's a huge honor to be in the presence of all of you. Um, Gabe, it's really lovely to finally meet you. Seriously. Cheryl, honored to um, be in your presence and thank you for the song and Annie Rollins I don't know you but your work has been exquisite this morning um, I just want to add to the kind of celebratory um, uh, engagement around this work Gabriel and you should be extremely um, happy and honored uh, for proud creating yeah proud for creating an event that um is as big almost and as as meaningful and engaging um and bringing together the very um potency and force that you describe so actively in the book i think the other thing that you know there have been so many nice comments about uh what the book does and i had some nice writing here i'm going to skip because most of it's been said by everybody so far but i think the one thing that nobody said yet is how well written it is. Um, so it's deeply engaging and deeply performative and gathering of others in a way that I think, you know, performs what it describes. And it's far more of a, more than a gathering of a field or an analysis of an assembly, which are all sort of tried and overused. I think what you've done here is activate and create forms of response and responsibility in ways that model and mirror um, very much what you're engaging with. Um, and from my perspective, at least deeply draw on um, much more intangible embodied forms of knowledge and understandings and appreciations um, of forms of tradition and heritage that are indeed radically collective and collectivizing. So congratulations, well done. Um, I am cheering you here and toasting you with my um, <laughs> coffee this morning. It's um, literally, I think it's um, just on 6 a.m. here. There is a future. It's tomorrow here in Australia already. Right. <laughs> small, small moan of futures. Um, but your book is also about the inordinate importance of the micro moment as indeed um, potent with the capacities for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely response, Jennifer. Wow. Thank yeah, you. maybe we can conclude the discussion yeah. since we're almost done. That was such a lovely note, and I'm so glad we were finally able to reach you, Jennifer, halfway across the world. Uh, we will invite you back. I think the CRLCC would be perfect uh, to have a talk about your own work. Thank you again so much to Cheryl. Thank you for Anna, who didn't appear but um, made, as I say, these beautiful visual poems for us. Thank you, especially to Gabe for gathering everyone together. I think it says something about the generosity of your person that uh, so many people did come to this event. Um, and uh, I think that's, yeah, I think that's a, uh, speaks well in your character, if I can talk like an old fashioned person. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so now we'll, for the concluding words, we'll, we'll turn.